Um, okay, we're going to jump in and kick things off. Uh, welcome to our fourth Zoom call. And the kind of the key question for tonight's Zoom call is, is capitalism making us sick? Hosted by The World Transformed and Momentum. We're planning on running this, these calls every Tuesday night at 8pm. So remember to keep this time free and to tune in. We currently have 329 people on the call and probably more on Facebook Live, uh, which is amazing. And it's always exciting to see so many people who kind of want to be engaged in this kind of um, these kind of talks that Momentum and the World Transform have been hosting. Uh, my name is Santiago. I work at Momentum and I'm also a Labour councillor in Islington in London. And my name is Beth and I'm one of Labour's community organisers. Um, welcome to our living room. Uh, we'll be hosting the call tonight. We hope you're all doing well in this very difficult time. Uh, tonight we'll be looking at how this unprecedented public health emergency has revealed just how unprepared and ill-equipped our health care system is for a crisis of this nature. The nurses, carers and doctors are doing an absolutely heroic job. I'm sure I speak on behalf of all of us when I extend my heartfelt thanks, appreciation and respect to each and every healthcare worker in our precious NHS. But the grim reality is that due to the failures of the Tory government, and the profit-driven system within, our, within which our NHS exists, healthcare workers are being sent into work every day without the adequate protection and access to testing they need. This is a national scandal, and it didn't have to be this way. Three years ago, the government ignored advice to stockpile proper PPE, which is personal protective equipment, and just for this kind of crisis because it was too expensive. And now healthcare workers are tragically paying with their lives. What's more, the pandemic is brutally exposing the dangerous role that big, profit-driven pharmaceutical companies play in determining access to medicines. We'll hear, about more that, hear more about this later. This pandemic is shining a spotlight on old problems which require immediate solutions. But this difficult moment must also force a conversation about the type of healthcare and welfare system we deserve for the future. We need to ask how we can change our profit and monopoly-centered medical innovation system and how we can ensure our health service always prioritizes public health over private wealth. Mm -hmm. But before we get started tonight, we wanted to take a quiet moment together to pay our respects to all the NHS workers who have tragically lost their lives caring for us. We'd appreciate if you'd join us in paying tribute to these heroic NHS workers. Nurse John Alagos, who was just 23 years old from Watford. Healthcare worker Glenn Corbyn, who came out of retirement to help with coronavirus from Brent, North West London. Nurse Liz Glanister from the Royal Liverpool University Hospital. Nurse and mother of three, Arima Nazreen, who was just 36 years old, from Warsaw Manor Hospital. Midwife Lindsay Coventry from Mid-Essex Hospital Services. Nurse Amy O'Rourke, who was just 39, from the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother Hospital in Margate. Dr Alpha Sardu, who worked at the Whittington Hospital in London. Nurse Thomas Harvey, who worked at Good Mace Hospital in North East London. Dr Amjed El Horne, who worked at Glenfield Hospital in Leicester. Pharmacist Pooja Sharma, just 33 years old, from East Sussex. GP Habib Zayedi, who worked at South End Hospital. And Dr Zayedi, a family GP. Thank you for sharing that moment with us. We know this is really upsetting time. When we have conversations like this tonight about policy, this is what's at stake, human life. But together, we can get through this immediate crisis and build a healthcare and welfare system which prioritises human need. Just before we start, we wanted to share a few links with you that we found useful in keeping up to date. Uh, we'll be sharing a report this call as well, so all those links will be in there, but I think they're just being posted in the group chat, um, so please have a look at those. So I'm going to give a quick outline of the brilliant speakers we have on the call tonight so you know what's going on, and then we'll get started. First of all, we have Danielle Tiplady, uh, who I think is here. Wave, yay! <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Danielle is an NHS nurse and founding member of Nurses United. Danielle will be sharing personal experiences of the conditions for healthcare workers, as well as telling us how we can stand in solidarity with nurses at this time. Danielle, we know how busy you are, so thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, next up, we're going to hear from Dermot McDonald, who is a lead organiser at Just Treatment, a patient-led campaign group who are demanding that fair access to medicines should come before drug company profits. He'll be sharing some eye-watering insights into the role Big Pharma has played in making us so underprepared for this global pandemic and, you, and what we can do about moving it forward. Then we'll hear from new MP and care worker Nadia Whittam. Nadia will share her insights as a care worker and will also set out what the Labour Party is and should be doing in response to COVID-19. Thank you so much for joining us. Mm. Uh, then we'll hear from Caroline Malloy, uh, editor of Open Democracy UK and editor of Our NHS. She'll put forward the ideas for alternative models of health, care and social security post-COVID-19. 
Finally, we were supposed to be joined by Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet. However, he's had to pull out at the last minute. Richard sends his apology, apologies, but we're very, very grateful to be joined very last minute by Joe Dobbin, who has offered to step in. Jo is a doctor and activist in London, and she'll talk through the current situation in our hospitals, the government's response to the crisis, and what we need to happen going forward. We should say we'll be done with the call in around 90 minutes, and if you have any questions throughout the call, please post them in the chat box. And after each speaker has spoken, we're going to be asking them the questions. We'll try to get through as many of them as possible. Um, and yeah, so please post and we'll get through them. Uh, finally, this is only our fourth ever Zoom call like this. So please bear with us if there are any technical issues, but we think so far so good, we should be fine. Um, so I think we're going to kick off. Uh, okay, so first up, we'll be hearing from the NHS nurse and founding member of Nurses United, and that's Danielle Titlady. Uh, Danielle, thank you so much for joining us. I believe you should be unmuted now. So I think straight over to you, Danielle. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining. Um, I'm going to be honest, I feel quite raw today. Um, it's a really emotional time. Uh, I know it is for everybody I know. Um, work's particularly uh, different. Um, it's quite tough and it's working in a way that we've never worked before and it's quite scary as well um, but obviously we're trying um, to do our best to deliver the best possible care for people just in quite difficult and different circumstances than I've certainly ever experienced. Um, we came into this short of 40,000 nurses, we came into this short of 100,000 staff in the NHS, we came into this short of 100,000 staff in social care um, and these are the people we're all you know the people that are going to get us through this so to start we were in quite a difficult situation and if you add into that as well the thousands of beds that the government have cut as well um, it has made it a lot harder than than what it could have been um, but I have to praise um, everybody from the estates um, to all of the key workers that have and the NHS who have worked so incredibly hard in the last two weeks to ensure that we have massive capacity. If you look at the Nightingale Hospital, they turn that around in days and we've got 4,000 beds there. Every single hospital has gone over and above to ensure that we have the capacity in order to deal with this. So I just wanna say a massive thank you to all of the workers in all the different departments and from every single field that have made that happen because I think it's really quite special what they've done. Um, we have a lot of issues on the front line. Um, I think one of them is being the testing. I had to be off work for seven days because I had symptoms of coronavirus. It could have been, it could not have been, um, but I don't know what it was because I wasn't able to get tested. And I know that they have rolled this out, but there isn't enough people that are being tested, staff members. And if you take into account the 40,000 shortage of nurses, and there's one in five nurses off sick, self-isolating, you can see that we're, that puts us in an even more difficult position to be able to try and deliver any kind of care that we want to. Um, and some of these nurses could be back at work as well. So. The testing has been a, a real, real problem, and not only because for us to get back to work, but also for our peace of mind as well, and about immunity, because we're going to be spending the next however long around this. So it would be good to know if if we have had it. Um, I think the worst thing that's going on at the moment and has been ever since it started is the lack of inadequate PPE. Um, I'm not quite sure what else can be said to try and address this is criminal actually that hospices and nursing homes and even NHS hospitals are going on Twitter and begging people for masks like what is going on that has come to this nothing that gets said seems to change this situation we keep getting told that there's however many million of this, however many thousand of that, which I appreciate that it might be there, but it's just not getting to us. And it's literally like banging up your head against a brick wall. I have so many colleagues who are going in, into this without the equipment, they need to do their job safely. And even if we have the correct PPE, there is a risk to our health here as well. So if you don't have the correct PPE, that's putting even more risk 
to our health and people are going into these situations helping the patients without staff when they really 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 shouldn't even this shouldn't even be happening and I don't know I like so much has been said about it I, I, I don't know what can be done to make people listen we just need to apply political pressure and not just on MPs I think as well I think on um, councillors and mayors and anybody who has any kind of influence because somebody has to do something about this like I don't think it's too much to ask that we have the jobs to the tools to do our job safely um, and it's really 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 distressing um, but this is that it's just not not materializing um and yeah i just i think it's criminal i think it's shameful that any of us are having to go around and ask i'm sitting here talking about it on a call to you begging you to help me like or help us like it's it's shameful it's a shame on this country um so i've been working with nurses united um and they have created a safety tool which has been collecting um, data from nurses about adequate PPE and whether they're having their masks um, correctly fitted and stuff at work. And I think it's quite quite a significant percentage of people that aren't having that done either um, when this is a requirement. So I would urge that everybody um, could share that tool as well. If Anthony could put it into the, to the chat, um, that would be very helpful. Or if it could be sent out to people or to share, you could all share this with nurses so we can collect as much data as possible to try and apply pressure on people. Um, and also, if you know any nurses, Nurses United are doing media training. Um, so that would be good to get more nurses speaking up in the media about this because we need to raise our voices from the front line um, and get out there what's really, really happening in order to try and try and push some change. Um, I was asked to talk about like the future. <sighs> I'm gonna be honest with you. I can't see past the next few days, let alone in the future. So I don't really know what to add to that. Um, just desperately wanna get my patients and well, all of you and my colleagues through this. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't answer a question about the future, I'm afraid, or say, comment on the future. Um, just take care, everyone. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danielle, for joining us. We're sending you so much love and solidarity. And yeah, you're amazing. Um, we've had lots of questions about what practically people can do to help, which I think you've covered. But if you have any more thoughts, please add. And then um, we've also had some people asking about your views on the clapping for NHS workers. Um, yeah. Clapping clapping yet oh I think it's brilliant um I wasn't expecting to feel the way that I did about it but as soon as I walked outside the house I just felt so overwhelmed with emotion um it's making me emotional thinking about it um just so grateful to everybody for their support um and it means the world to know that they're behind us um I'm not going to say that I think clapping for I won't be clapping for Boris tonight um, but I'll continue clapping um, for the NHS. Um, I think I think it's absolutely amazing, and thank you all so much for doing it. It means so much. Thank you so much, Danielle. Most of the comments in the group right now are just saying lots of love and solidarity. So yeah, it's worth you scrolling through. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. It's very difficult for all NHS workers. We really really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, lots of love. Um, so we're going to go move on to our next speaker. Um, so sorry, who who is now? I found it. We're going to move on to the next speaker, which is Dermot McDonald, uh, the lead organizer of Just Treatment. Just Treatment are a brilliant patient-led campaign group fighting for fair access to medicine uh, in the NHS. One of the few good things to happen at the end of 2019 um, was the big win that Just Treatment were part of, securing access to cystic fibrosis drug or can be on the NHS, which has made a huge difference to people's lives across the UK. Uh, we can't wait to hear from you. Where are you? I'm here. Can you Amazing. see me? Amazing, thank you. There we go. Awesome. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, really nice to be with you because everybody I'm sure feels as weird and as confused by what's happening at the moment. So it's nice to be with friends. Um, and yeah, um, really difficult to follow Danielle. Um, I know Danielle a little bit. and. 
like every kind of NHS worker that we know, she's sinking her heart and soul um, into her job right now for the good of everybody. And it's a complete inspiration. Um, and it's an outrage that they don't have the, um, hi Danielle, it's an outrage that they don't have the access to the protective clothing that they need and the protective masks and, and, and the testing that they need to, to keep themselves safe in their job. Um, one thing that we've done, we are a patient-led movement. We're about organizing NHS patients that have been screwed over by pharmaceutical companies. And we're starting to work now on how the privatization of the health services impacted on NHS patients. One thing we're doing at the minute is organizing for NHS patients to demand the government um, supports NHS uh, staff with the proper equipment. So on our website, which I just shared in the link, um, there's an action you can take. And if you can also share on Twitter and social media, like a message of like the times that um, NHS staff have been there for you, um, that it's really important that the government is there to care for them right now, because um, it's really, really critical. Um, I'm gonna try and share my screen to talk a little bit um, about some of the issues around the pharmaceutical industry, which I hope will work. Um, it should uh, pop up now. Um, I'm aiming not to talk in too much detail about this thing because it's a really uh, complex subject, but I just want to I think Dermot might have just dropped off for a second, so we'll give it 10 seconds, see if he's going to jump back on. I wanted to give a bit of an insight into um, we just lost you for a second, but you're back. Um, I am here. Okay, that was Brilliant. bad. Go for it. Timing. Um, can you still see the um, screen? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so just basically a, a, a quick run through of, of some of the challenges that we're facing as a consequence of the way that we've structured the um, pharmaceutical industry right now. Um, for some reason, this is not... There we go. So basically to say, like, um, I think this is a really important way to think about how this pandemic is playing out. Like this virus is not just innately evil. Um, it's not happening in a vacuum. It is essentially exposing the and, and preying upon the vulnerabilities that we've created within our society. This is a quote from an author of a book on the history of epidemics and society. And it basically highlights that the political choices that we have made to prioritize certain groups and individuals has determined who is vulnerable um, and how the uh, pandemic is impacting upon our society. And one of those vulnerabilities that the epidemic is uh, exploiting is the structure of our pharmaceutical innovation model. So the way that we um, create and provide access to new medicines. Now, one of the things that's really important to say is that um, the, the pharmaceutical industry is one of the most profitable industries in the world. Um, it makes more money every year than oil and gas. It makes more money every year than energy companies in terms of percentage profit. Um, and so it does really well out of the system as it currently is, but it's really increasingly failing us. We knew that there was a pandemic of a coronavirus coming. This isn't the first coronavirus epidemic that we've had. There were uh, there was a SARS outbreak in 2002, there was the MERS outbreak in uh, 2012, both of which were also coronaviruses. Um, and so in some ways, uh, the current epidemic we're facing is kind of known by some as a, as a SARS-2 uh, uh, virus, because it's really similar in some ways to the first SARS outbreak in 2002. And so we should have been better prepared for this. And this is a smiling doctor. He's a researcher in Texas. He was funded by the US government to develop a potential vaccine for SARS-1 that could have been used potentially for SARS-2. And he gave evidence in, in the US Senate at the start of March saying basically in the end, industry is not interested in investing in a vaccine that they would have to stockpile. No one wants to invest in a product designed not to be used. So in 2016, he had a promising vaccine that his researchers had developed and they couldn't get the funding that was needed, which normally comes from the private sector to take it through later stage trials so we could be closer to having a vaccine that could work. So that's a real missed opportunity. That's three years when we could have been further on in our search for a treatment or a vaccine uh, than we currently are. And with thousands of people dying every day, like those three years are a huge waste 
of potential opportunity to allow our society to be better prepared. Um, and it's really, really important to note that whenever we are thinking about how we do innovation right now, we really um, have got a huge amount of investment from, from taxpayers, from the public sector. Since SARS, the US government alone has spent 700 million developing uh, treatments and vaccines for coronaviruses like COVID-19. And just in one year alone, the world's four biggest vaccine producers made $30 billion in, in, in their sales of vaccines. Yet last year, there are only six clinical trials happening for coronavirus and all of them significantly funded by the public purse. So really what we're seeing at the moment is um, the socialization of the risk around the development of new medicines and vaccines and then the privatization of the profits. So despite the fact all of this money comes from the government, uh, both the US and the UK and European governments to fund the development of new medicines, we get no safeguards that the price that they're gonna be sold to us at is affordable or that we can get access to them um, uh, for everybody that needs it around the world. Um, so I'd ask like, what do we do about that? And I would say one of the things that we've been doing is organizing the patients that these kinds of problems affect. This is a picture of Lewis meeting with uh, Jeremy Corbyn uh, ahead of the uh, conference last autumn. Lewis needed access to a treatment for cystic fibrosis, which um, has been mentioned earlier on, but the US drug company that was making it was demanding 105,000 pounds per patient per year for the NHS. And the NHS simply couldn't afford that high price. Um, and so we worked and got support from labor to get the government to threaten that company with breaking their patent in order to force them to drop their price. And it worked. We managed to get that uh, drug made available on the NHS at a lower price that the NHS can afford. And Labour went further and published a paper last year with a whole range of proposals around how we can fix loads of these fundamental problems with the profit-driven pharmaceutical system. So it's really, really critical is when we're responding to COVID-19, we don't allow uh, Labour to drop those really brilliant proposals and we make sure that they um, champion them and force the government to take them on as well. So we really have seen a complete failure of the pharmaceutical innovation model that's costing the lives of people um, all around the world. And we've got to ask ourselves, how do we rebuild stronger? How do we rebuild with more equity? And, and how do we basically design an economic system that values life and dignity? And really critically, the way we do this better is through collaboration, through solidarity and holding people in authority to account. So not the kind of competition and profiteering and monopoly based system that we've got at the moment. And right now, I think, you know, we can all agree like this feels like frightening, it feels overwhelming, and it feels like I'm not exactly sure what we do in response to this. But we've had these kind of overwhelming crises of healthcare in the past. Um, in the 90s, 80s, 90s, and the early 2000s, the AIDS pandemic was killing millions around the world. And the pharmaceutical industry was standing in the way of getting fair access to HIV treatment for all of those people that needed it. And we managed to have the most effective uh, movement led by people living with that disease to face up to the pharmaceutical uh, industry and force them to back down. And we won and we think we can do that again. So one of the things we're trying to do uh, is to try and build a patient's charter that tries to replicate the momentum that we generated through the AIDS movement um, and having by creating a patient's charter for how we respond to COVID. There's a link in the top right. If you go and take a bit of time to have a look at it, um, it's still in draft form, so it's a bit of a sneak preview. It's a little bit long at the moment. We're going to try and trim it down. But please, we want to kind of crowdsource uh, a, a, a charter that can be the kind of constitution for how we can form a new fight, a new patient and people led movement to push back against big pharma and get a fair system for developing and providing access to medicines. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. I mean, that was incredibly interesting. And I think, uh, I know for me personally, lots of the conversations we've been having is about what we can do directly right now. And you've kind of given us a perspective that we haven't heard enough of, which is how we ended up here and what are the kind of the steps and the routes that have led us to this point. And that's so interesting. Um, and speaking of interesting, we've also got some very good questions for you. The first one being, are there any countries that are responding better by being willing to take on Big Pharma? Yeah, 
basically uh, there is. So there's, it's really, um, it's really interesting that, um, so I'm trying to decide how technical to get in this. Basically, so we incentivize the development of new medicines by giving drug companies a monopoly during which time they can sell those drugs back to us at the highest price they can get away with. Um, but whenever the rules were written, everybody realized that it would be a really bad idea to make that monopoly absolute. And so we've got, our governments have got the right to break those monopolies. Um, but sadly, we are, our politicians and our political system are so in hock to the pharmaceutical industry, we don't use that power often enough. Now, what's happened in response to COVID-19 is that governments around the world have realized that actually, this is a total crisis. We need to put the health of our citizens first instead of putting the profits of pharmaceutical industries first. And a number of countries have threatened to break the monopolies that those drug companies ha have on promising COVID medicines and other technologies. Like Israel have done that, Canada and Germany have legislated to make it easier for them to do that. So countries are stepping up and prioritizing their citizens. And that's absolutely something that the UK should be doing. We're calling for them to um, help the World Health Organization create basically one big um, pool of all of the useful technology and information around developing the medicines for COVID-19 so that every country will be able to use them without any monopolies blocking the way. And we want the UK government to support that. Brilliant. Uh, I've got one more question. Um, and it's about, are just treatment planning to tackle the likely chance that the vaccine for COVID-19 will be privatised? If so, what can we do to help? Yeah, absolutely. Like the, the, the scary thing is, it's not, it's not a chance that it will be privatized. Right now, unless we fight, it will be privatized. And we've got, despite the fact it's been taxpayers bankrolling the development of these vaccines, we've got no guarantees that everybody around the world that needs them are going to be able to access them at an affordable price. Uh, and so it's really, really important that we organize to prevent the uh, monopolies on those vaccines because those monopolies are the things that are holding the lives of people to ransom and so what yeah we're organizing we, we've got uh, the patients charter which I shared um, in the presentation and we're planning on working with other allies including um, uh, Global Justice Now and others to uh, organize to force governments to guarantee that uh, vaccines will be affordable and accessible for everybody that needs them. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time to explain this talk tonight. Um, it was incredibly insightful. And I think really highlights how important the fight against Big Pharma is, not just in general, but especially now in this time. Um, and thank you for what you've been doing. I think Rory from Well Transform should be posting a link uh, to Just Treatment's petition. Um, as patients of the NHS, we should all stand in solidarity with healthcare workers and demand that they get access to the PP and to testing. And I think that link should be posted in the chat now. Um, we just wanted to say it'd be really good to hear from some of your suggestions for useful things that people can get involved with. So uh, please do post your suggestions in the chat. We'll try and share them both during this call and afterwards. Um, and it's also just want to say that we've got now, I think about 375 people on the call and about 40 to 50 people on Facebook Live, which is amazing. Um, one of the few other good things that happened in our movement at the end of 2019, um, apart from the victory for just treatment, was also the election of a few brilliant new socialist MPs, one of whom is Nadia Whitten. Um, who was kind of part of the brand new intake before Parliament? Nadia was a care worker, and since then, um, since the crisis, she's, began, she's actually returned back to work and her previous job to help out this difficult time. Um, Nadia, we know you're incredibly busy, and we really appreciate you taking the time out to be on this call. So um, I'll take it straight over to you, Nadia. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Can I just check that this volume is all right for everyone? Because I don't have yeah. enough. Great. Well, I hope that everyone's okay. I know that this is a really difficult time for everybody, um, self-isolating. So I want to send my solidarity to everyone, but particularly pay tribute to our key workers, our nurses like Danielle, our carers, our paramedics, pharmacists, cleaners, shop workers, refuse workers, all the people who have always kept the country afloat and we've always known that they were key workers, but now finally the government is forced to recognise that these are the people who keep society ticking. It's not the bankers or the stockbrokers or the footballers, it's the cleaners, it's the people who have been looking after our safety and well-being, often at the expense of their own during this crisis. 
I think that as far as the NHS and social care is concerned, it's not an exaggeration to say that this is a crisis within a crisis. And the burden of that is on low paid, often women workers, um, and also often migrant workers too, particularly the lowest paid amongst those. Um, for the last decade, at least, we've seen the underfunding of the NHS and social care. Um, professions have been undervalued. And finally, that's the government is recognising that that these people are key workers, but that's not being matched by rights for those key workers. And for me, that's a really important thing is yes, we're seeing more government investment and more public spending. And of course, I welcome that. And I welcome the measures that the government has taken so far, but this isn't translating into more power for workers and that's the real test. Still, we've got many thousands and thousands of people who fall through the gaps in government provision. We've got colleagues like my colleagues and Danielle's who are working without adequate PPE. Where I work, I'm fortunate that, that we do have PPE, but it's in very short supply. Um, and we have people who for example, in the gig economy or some self-employed people who are excluded from the scheme, who are having to go to work anyway, even though it's unsafe, because they can't afford not to, because they either don't qualify for statutory sick pay, which is low anyway, they can't be furloughed, um, or they, um, they just... Um, they can't afford to not to go into work because they've got rents to pay, mortgages, bills, and children to feed. None of that stops during this period of time. Um, an interesting point about preparedness for this crisis is that the National Risk Register has consistently identified a flu pandemic as the biggest risk to us and yet the NHS and social care is totally unprepared. We were already getting by just by the skin of our teeth as it was. I know that in social care so much of social care depends on care workers going the extra mile just to to meet people's basic needs because just because the government cuts funding for social care, it doesn't mean that people stop having social care needs. So that's met basically in people's free time. Um, I think we're going to, and on top of the national shortage that we already have, we're going to see a further national shortage of care workers and healthcare workers. And that's exacerbated by the fact that um, the agency staff and who would otherwise fill in and um, contracted staff themselves falling ill, having to self-isolate or dying. The problems in social care are, are very much the same as in the NHS, but and we, we see how undervalued the NHS is, despite, despite the government, government ministers clapping, they're not funding it. And then social care is even the poor relation to the NHS. So our problems are the same, a shortage of PPE, we're right at the bottom of the pile, um, lack of, of testing, um, people being, discharged from hospital and back into care homes, and there being no provision to keep staff and residents safe. Um, and then also very little financial protection for care workers, particularly those on zero hours contracts to self-isolate. Some people just can't afford to. 
And then there's the fact that in the coronavirus bill, this is, so, some elements in that bill I welcome, but one of the really concerning things for me was that this bill would allow local authorities to lower the care that some people receive as part of prioritising care. And then I'd like to move on to workers' rights and the welfare system, because what coronavirus has really shone a light on is the dire state of workers' rights and our welfare system. It's worse now, but we should be clear that this is an extension of existing conditions. These problems aren't new and harm has already been caused by the global capitalist economic system that we live in. And we know that inequality makes us sick and that this pandemic is playing out along the inequalities that already exist in our society. Overall and fundamentally, class and wealth, people who have a lot of money and can afford to, to self-isolate in holiday homes or are able to work from home. And I appreciate that not everybody who, who works from home is, is wealthy. Many, many of them aren't. Um, but also inequalities with regards to race and gender. So gendered violence is increasing. Um, racial violence is likely to increase. It's particularly in care work, um, nurses, cleaners, uh, overwhelmingly women. And I think this point about inequality and um, coronavirus playing out along the lines of existing health inequalities, it's highlighted by the Marmot Review 10 years on. I don't know whether anyone's had, um, had a chance to have a look at that, but this has shown how things have got so much worse in the last decade. Life expectancy overall hasn't increased. The gaps have widened. Life expectancy for people from the most deprived backgrounds has actually fallen. Um, a substantially greater rate of increase in inequalities, especially for women since 2010 um, in the previous decade, than in the previous decade. Um, and then of course, local authorities in the most deprived areas like, like Nottingham, like Manchester, Liverpool, um, the Labour voting cities have faced the biggest cuts compared with, um, with the Tory shires. So I'm aware that I'm, I'm probably running out of time and I want to leave time for questions. So what Labour MPs are doing, I think John Ashworth is doing a fantastic job um, in holding the government to account and being uh, critical constructively to ensure that they, um, that they implement the measures that we need urgently. So Labour was, of course, calling for a lockdown um, that has now happened. Um, we're calling for adequate PPE for frontline workers, um, for the closure of non-essential workplaces. Lots of you will be aware of building sites, for example, staying open. And I think that here the government advice is deliberately ambiguous so as to leave room for, for profit making. And we saw that in the, the first kind of thoughts that came from the government when social distancing guidelines were announced. It wasn't what about the health of, of our of individual well-being, the health of our workers and our people. It was about the economy. And part of our job is to rethink what the economy means. It's not just this abstract thing that is about generating profit for shareholders. It's about serving the interests, the needs, and the, the well-being of people. Um, 
we're also talking about um, drawing attention to people who have fallen through the cracks. So I've written to the Chancellor this week, calling on him to implement um, an emergency universal basic income as a simple way to stop people from falling through the cracks, um, to make the self-employment scheme available to all self-employed people, and either to, to make it effective before June or during that period of time to cancel rent and bills because otherwise people will and already are just going under. Um, the other things that we've been doing is working closely with the trade unions, of course, um, and I've just been on a Zoom call with IWGB who are doing fantastic work on this as well. So as a secondary plug, I'd urge you to have a look at, at what they're doing and if you can to donate to their crowdfunder because they're suing the government for um, the discriminatory actions that they've taken towards um, different categories of worker. So the cat's out of the bag. The government is investing more than than it ever has certainly in in my lifetime and we've got to stop the defenders of status quo capitalism from putting the cat back in the bag once this pandemic is over Thank you so much, Nadia. It's amazing to have you with us. Um, we've had loads and loads of questions. It's quite funny. Every time a question was asked, you then answered it in your next section. So <laughs> you know you know exactly what's going on. Um, I'm going to give you a couple together and then you can uh, answer them. So one that you touched on was around what more unions could be doing regarding PPE in the NHS. Uh, another question was around should the PLP lead a campaign like a new deal for the NHS and what more can the PLP be doing um, uh, around coronavirus? And then the last question was, should student NHS loans be reimbursed? Uh, to the last question, I think a simple yes. And to anyone who's already campaigning on this, um, I'm sure Danielle will have more information about that. Um, please hit me up and I'll give whatever support and values of that that I can. Um, sorry, I've forgotten the other two questions. No worries. Um, one thing in my head at a time during lockdown. That's okay. Uh, so uh, what more can unions be doing regarding PPE in the NHS? And should the PLP be leading a campaign like a, a new deal for the NHS? I think that's an excellent idea, um, a campaign. Um, like a new deal for the NHS. I'd add that I think that it should be, that it should include social care and a national care service. And every time I go into work, I think how different this would be if we, um, if we had a national care service that the Labour, that Labour has promised if we'd won that election. Um, I'd be interested to hear in your, to hear your ideas about a new deal for, for the NHS. Um, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, in terms of what more unions can do with regards to PPE, um, I think this is a bit difficult because we can't quite establish where, where the problem is. We're, of course, there's a problem with supply, but we're also receiving conflicting information and advice from government. So I think, um, I think unions need to be led by workers in, in different areas and different sectors. So what delivery riders call for, for example, because they need PPE as well, will be quite different to what NHS staff call for. And then social care staff in the different types of social care, whether it's care homes, community care, um, will also be calling for, for different things. Um, but I think that the unions need to be raising a huge noise about this. Um, the GMB have been doing this very, very well, as have Unison. But I, I would say that I think the unions, the, the non-TUC affiliated unions like IWGB in particular, should be 
brought into the fold and we work more collaboratively because they're also doing excellent work. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, and yeah, there's lots of comments in the group in the chat that you might want to read. Lots of thanks for you coming along. Um, yeah. Um, just before we move on to our next speaker, I just want to take this quick opportunity to plug the TWT supporters network. So the coronavirus crisis poses an existential threat to independent grassroots organizations and small businesses alike. Um, but independent grassroots organizations like TWT in this time of global crisis and uncertainty, collective political education on the left is more important than ever. Yet we are running on a shoestring budget. We know many people are in tough financial situations, especially right now. And we will always ensure that content like this, which we're doing tonight, um, is always available free of charge to everyone. However, if you are someone who is secure financially, and if you believe that the work that TWT does is important, which I personally do, uh, please consider supporting, like I do, at TWT to help us scale up and support this work. Um, you can sign up at bit.ly forward slash support TWT. That's bit.ly forward slash support TWT. That should be posted in the chat as well. Um, and thank you so much. Amazing. So uh, our next speaker is the brilliant Caroline. Uh, can we see you? I'm sure you're there somewhere. Um, yay, there we go. Hi, <laughs> editor of Open Rocks UK and INHS. Caroline, straight over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm muted. Sorry, this is the first time I've done one of these Zoom conferences. Um, but thanks very much for inviting me. Can people hear me okay? All yeah. good. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, yeah, no, I'm kind of blown away by the previous speakers, really. And uh, yeah, I, I was going to start actually by showing doing what I couldn't do if I was on a platform doing this, which is showing you my favourite mug. Um, I don't know if you can see this, hopefully. It says, no society can legitimately call itself civilised if a sick person is denied medical care because of a lack of means. Um, and that's a quote from Nye Bevan, founder of the NHS given to me, by the way, by Protect Our NHS, a really great NHS campaign group in Bristol. And I suppose one thing I would say about all the questions about what people can do is I'm sure many people on this call have already done this, but you know, there are so many active local NHS campaign groups at the moment that would really uh, welcome new energy, I think, with open arms. Um, I actually, you'd asked me, I think, to talk a little bit about kind of radical visions for the NHS. And I mean, a bit, you know, I'm, it's, it's, we're all thinking about that and finding it overwhelming to think about. So actually, I started by turning to uh, Nye Bevan again that for his founding vision of the NHS. Um, and it's in this book, uh, In Place of Fear, which I think is a good thing to bear in mind at the moment. We all need a bit of that. And he said, this is the only other quote I'll do, by the way. He said, uh, preventable pain. No, sorry, wrong quote. He said, society becomes more wholesome, more serene and spiritually healthier if it knows that its citizens have at the back of their consciousness the knowledge that not only themselves, but all their fellows have access when ill to the best that medical skill can provide. And I love that quote. Um, and I think, you know, we hear that stuff and we look at what's happening in America and we comfort ourselves, rightly so, that we have the NHS here. Uh, do we know that, you know, with the situation with migrants in, in particular that I'll talk about in a little bit? Um, but other groups too have been excluded for too long. And I think now's the time to really think about how we can um, reject some of those narratives that have enabled that because, you know, the right is also thinking about its radical visions at the moment. We already see the Telegraph. I can't even bring myself to say what the Telegraph is saying about the NHS right now. Um, you know, and be ready to kind of, in the way that perhaps we weren't after the 2008 crisis, to offer some counter narratives and counter visions. Um, you know, that we are only as strong as our, our weakest link, basically. And I think, you know, in terms of public health, I mean, I really echo a lot of what Nadia was talking about in terms of public health. I think one of the problems is that the right has really captured actually some of the official public health people a bit before this all happened and there's quite a kind of right-wing horrible narrative that public health means finger wagging about who's deserving and people's behaviors and you know you have you have fat people not just being stigmatized as bankrupting the nhs but also actually banned from having routine nhs operations in some areas for the last few years 
Uh, you same for smokers, also banned from having routine NHS operations, obviously getting emergency care. You know, this is the background, like Nadia said, the crisis within a, within a crisis. You've also got old people. You know, you had Jeremy Hunt saying that the aging population was a po problem more serious than climate change. Old people being stigmatized as bed blockers. And I think some of the frankly horrific discussion about taking it on the chin, you know, we, we see that narrative playing out in a horrendous way now. Um, so, you know, when we talk about public health, we need to get back to what it, that it's not about looking for undeserving people using that kind of same horrible narrative that we used in the, the, the benefit system. You know, I see a comment about the society driving the obesity crisis on the chat and absolutely, you know, the, the public health prevention pro programs like Stop Smoking, like Lose Weight and all of these things are things that have been cut, as are all the things that we know uh, are, are protective of good health, you know. So uh, the social factors around health, primarily, primarily poverty and inequality as the biggie, obviously, as Nadia said, you know, poor quality housing. I think it's interesting that Bevan, the founder of the NHS, was also the Minister for Housing. Um, access to green spaces, you know, all of these things. And there has been some discussion within the NHS, like the NHS needs to fix everything in the last few years. The NHS should be prescribing people choirs and walks in the park. And I think this is a back, bit back to front. The NHS needs to get on with doing, you know, now, of course, and afterwards, get on with doing what it is good at and you know providing the preventative programs but not trying to do everything you know we need a welfare state for that we need the rest of the welfare state and not just the NHS bit that we've held on to uh, you know the NHS get on with what it's doing not just be a cash cow for the private sector and you know in terms of the the social security safety net and one of the really big areas of preventing ill health right now and always you know the Nadia talked a little bit about the uh the benefit system like so we are open democracy have been campaigning hard on the benefit system and calling for a, a, a guaranteed livable income for all so actually not a universal basic income because i think right now politically the government has topped up a lot of people's wages but people are having to wait and some people are falling through the gap so what we're saying is no one should fall below a basic income so no one should fall below a basic income of uh 20,000 a year, basically, the, the real living wage. And actually, that's the sort of thing that seemed politically impossible until recently. But the TUC yesterday came out with quite similar proposals. We're working with the uh, New Economics Foundation and we are uh, petitioning the Chancellor on that. And I'll put the link in the chat afterwards. Um, I've been talking a lot for years to MEDACT and Docs Not Cops about the issues with migrants. The current situation is that, in theory, migrants with coronavirus are excluded from the horrendous charging regime that is in place for, my, for most many migrants now, in theory. But the point is, you have to get tested. And if the test is negative, then you can still be charged, it would, it would seem, which is a crazy situation, huge disincentive for migrants to come forward. Uh, and, you know, you've also got the hostile environment and information sharing with the Home Office and all of this, you know, Ireland, Portugal, other countries have got rid of their anti-migrant provisions and, and we really need to do the same. I think Jason, uh, the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants is putting out a call on that tomorrow, I believe. Um, I just wanted to pick up a little bit on the issue around the cash cow, the NHS, what, what's happened to it so far, you know, and again, I think one of the other things that I've really noticed in this coronavirus talk is uh, in the media coverage is this message that we need the private sector to ride into the rescue. We need Amazon and Boots and all these private companies to ride in and, and rescue us. We need the private hospitals who frankly wouldn't be doing any operations or getting any money now anyway. So the fact that they've let us use their beds at cost price is not as generous as it sounds. In fact, it's just another bailout for an effectively privatised part of the healthcare system. Um, so yeah, we have this message that the private sector is more efficient, you know, research that I've done in the past, talking even to not particularly radical people like Lib Dems, estimating that the bureaucracy of administering this piecemeal system, let alone the fragmentation of it, uh, is costing possibly as much as 30 billion pounds a year. Um, I spoke to Colin Lees, who wrote this book, which is another book I would recommend, although it's a bit out of date, 
uh, Richard Horton, who was due to be here, said it was indispensable, the plot against the NHS. And that talks about how the system was set up under the new Labour government, as, uh, which is important to know at this juncture while we're thinking about what pressures might be coming to bear, hopefully resisted uh, by the, the new Labour leadership. Um, I think, you know, a lot of comments have been made about PPE and procurement and testing. And um, what I, one thing, you know, in this idea that the private sector is going to be the ones to ride to the rescue. Well, actually, procurement and testing, specifically pathology labs, are two of the areas that have been significantly, not entirely, but significantly privatized in recent years. Now, I honestly don't know the extent to which that is a factor in the, um, the, the mess that it's currently in, but I think it's absolutely the right question. You know, I think we won't know all the answers probably until afterwards. If people on this call have any information, please let me know. Um, but these are absolutely the right questions to be asking right now to resist this, this other failed narrative that's being pushed at us and will be pushed at us, shock doctrine style, as we're all kind of disorientated and, and wondering what's going on, you know. Um, you know, NHS 111 that we're all relying on heavily at the moment, that's also been privatised in my area. It's run, I phoned it this morning, I was actually not feeling very well, not the virus, I think. But, um, and it's, uh, it was Care UK, private company that's donated to the Tory party, runs NHS 111 in quite a lot of areas. Um, and we see that with the cleaners as well. Of course, they were the first to be privatised and now we see the dreadful situations that they're in. And I really support what's being said about backing both the traditional and the newer trade union. Um, the last sort of area that I just wanted to touch on briefly, uh, privatisation needs to be abolished, says Christine. Yes, I absolutely agree, basically. And even the piece, the Cinderella bits of the service that, um, you know, mental health, sexual health, things that weren't actually perfect in the good old days, you know, and were hierarchical and not always well delivered, you know. It's not just about harking back to the structures of the past, but it is absolutely about that founding vision and that state-run NHS and the rest of the welfare state underneath it supporting it. Um, the last thing I just want to say very quickly, if I've got a minute or so more, is uh, that technology is a really interesting, you know, obviously at the moment we're all relying very heavily on technology and I've been researching and just recently written about the whole agenda around digital health and whose agenda that is in the interests of. Obviously at the moment we need to rely on uh, these mechanisms but you know you've got people like the head of NHS Digital, NHS X it's now called, saying that the, the, the way that we're all accessing doctors now online and via phone is going to expedite the new future. That's going to be the way it is. Now that might be good in some circumstances but actually, we need a much bigger national conversation about a really proper political debate about technology as much as privatisation. Of course, computers are handy because they don't organise, speak out and fight back in the way that, you know, workers like Danielle and many brave healthcare workers do. Uh, but also as a patient, you know, this, this form of communication is better than nothing, I guess we're all finding. But is it optimum? Do we want to be able to have a choice? And I really hope that that will be part of the discussion as we go forward about what a, what a proper vision of the future NHS will look like. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we've got quite a few questions here. So let me just try and bring out the first ones. So this, these two questions are kind of linked. So the first is, how do we articulate a vision for the NHS beyond more than just funding? And then how do we convince the Labour Party to kind of put this vision forward? <laughs> the second question is a biggie, maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in, terms, in terms of articulating a vision beyond just funding, I completely agree. I mean, actually, the two questions are linked. If I'm honest, and I hope I'm amongst friends here, I have sometimes felt frustrated by messaging from Labour that has been primarily about funding because to be honest I think the public just switch off when they hear these billions and the Tories saying we spent this and Labour saying no you haven't and whatever the point is not just the money going in it's the bucket it's going into and how many holes in that bucket where it's leaking out we need to seal up that bucket so that money is spent on healthcare, not wasted on administering a market you know doctors and nurses telling me that they're spending huge amounts of time writing contracts, writing bids, trying to see off tenders. I mean, really ridiculous amounts of time because it's done in this very bitty way. Um, and actually, you know, 
imagine if all our healthcare workers and managers who've spent all their time, so much time wasted doing that, had actually had the time and opportunity in the last few years to do what they would have perhaps preferred to be doing, which is improving our healthcare system and getting prepared for, as, as people have said, the pandemic that we, we've always known was, was likely to come. Um, and in terms of the Labour Party, um, I, I think now, I mean, certainly on the social security stuff, I have been heartened by the fact that Labour is much more willing to be radical even now uh, than it was. I think that it is important to um, hold John Athworth's feet to the fire, actually. Um, I'm not, yeah, I don't know what more I want to say about that. I mean, that kind of brings that kind of brings us to our to the next question, which was, what is the role of um, opposition during this time, um, during the kind of the, the immediate effects of the pandemic? I mean, it's it, I appreciate it's really hard for the opposition right now for all sorts of reasons, um, and 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 including the fact that Parliament is is kind of currently suspended. But I think there is a, a, a real information vacuum out there. You know, I would like questions asked about the privatisation of procurement the privatisation of the pathology labs. I appreciate that is difficult because some of that was done under new labour um, auspices. Some of it was initiated under that. But I would hope that, you know, great MPs like Nadia would not let the Tories bat that away with that nonsense. You know, this, we've moved on a long way from then. And uh, yeah, I think it's really important that they're asking these questions about, about private sector involvement and not just taking it as the, the, the white knight. Brilliant. I think one of the questions, I think a theme for some of the questions we had, um, and I think something that's reliant on us as activists is educating ourselves on the kind of more of the intricacies within the NHS. And I wonder if you had some suggestions for books that people should be reading about the NHS or kind of where's a starting place or well, a couple of suggestions. So like this one is free on the internet and it's just one short chapter, uh, Nye Bevan's In Place of Fear, one short chapter on the NHS beautifully written and it and it's so I mean it talks about things like charging migrants you know it's very much still relevant today as I say this is a really good foundation book um I would also encourage people to watch uh Thicko if they haven't already again it's quite old but it explains quite well the accountable care organization model which is similar to and explicitly cited by Jeremy Hunt and Simon Stevens, the man in charge of the NHS. So, you know, it's talking about healthcare management organizations in America, um, which supposedly improve the incentives. Um, and, and actually, you know, I think that understanding of the fact that those companies that Michael Moore is talking about in that sicko film, companies like United Health, are over here embedded in the back offices of the NHS. And I think that's quite an eye-opening one to people. And I guess I should also plug Open Democracy uh, and our, our NHS section, but also Open Democracy UK, where we're talking a lot about these issues as well. I, I edit both of them these days. Um, also, in terms of reaching out for groups, I mean, keep our NHS public, health, care, health campaigns together. You know, these are really good ways to find your local organisations who can sit down with you and explain when you're scratching your head, because it is all does sometimes get quite complicated, for sure. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we just have one more question, which was about um, how can people challenge the long term plan before it's turned into law? Well, I mean, we've got a bit of breathing space, I guess. You know, we were expecting some legislation in, in April, I think. For people who don't know, the long term plan is, well, what it sounds like, really. But it does talk about some of the kinds of things I was talking about in terms of accountable care organisations, which have very essentially incentives inbuilt to undertreat people and a lot of technology assumptions that that's going to save us all, all sorts of nonsense in the long-term plan, relying on volunteers. Um, I think, you know, the political debate off right now is really interesting. All of these things, volunteers, technology, are, you know, both on display and very necessary, but also we can see that that is problematic to be entirely relying on these things. And I think that people maybe are able to use that kind of current narrative to be writing to MPs, you know, point them to articles on Open Democracy on, on some of the other campaigning websites and say, do you really understand what's in this plan beneath the kind of 
motherhood and apple pie language because it is it is extremely worrying. Brilliant. Caroline, thank you so much. Really appreciate you taking the time to go into such depth and detail about kind of, of how we've ended up where we are and what we can do going forward. Really appreciate it. Um, we're still waiting for Joe to join us on the call. Uh, they've literally just come off shift and they're cycling over now. So I think we can kind of forgive them for being a bit late. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to give you a quick update and then we're going to pop back to Nadia who wants to make a few more contributions. Uh, so before we go back to Nadia, I just wanted to say that um, in the general election, Momentum launched uh, My Campaign Map, which was a digital tool that let you know what constituencies needed you most during the general election. And we've repurposed the map now for the fight against coronavirus. If you head to volunteercoronavirus.com, type in your postcode, and you'll be able to find lots of the Facebook groups and WhatsApp groups um, that people are using for mutual aid and to contribute on the local level. Um, we've also now added a live stream feature where you can find calls like this that we're doing tonight and calls hosted by a range of uh, organizations on the left. So you can kind of constantly be up to date, kept up to date um, on and kind of educated on what's happening around coronavirus. And that's on volunteercoronavirus.com. Uh, so please check that out. Uh, so now we're just going to pop back to Nadia, who I believe had one or, few, uh, one or two more contributions to add. Hi, um, I just wanted to very quickly mention because I was supposed to say this, but it was on the, the next page of my Word document and it's been a long day. <laughs> um, the, the migrants' rights angle is also really important here. Um, the immigration bill is due to be returning to Parliament for its second reading. We don't know when, but just a heads up that people need to be prepared to mobilise against this at potentially very short notice and potentially virtually. Um, rather than in the streets as we usually would. Um, this is the immigration bill that designates care workers as low skilled um, and all sorts of other things entrenching and extending the hostile environment. Um, so as well as um, campaigns on pay for workers, I'll be working on this and on no recourse to public funds and also releasing people from detention, which is a big problem because um, detention centres are, are breeding grounds for um, infection and viruses. So I'd, I'll keep you updated on that. And I'd also really welcome everybody's thoughts on all of the above. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Nadia. Um, I believe Joe is now on the call. Um, but while they're, while they're being found, I'm um, just going to kind of run through. Oh, oh I think we found hi. them. Brilliant. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, we're on to our final speaker. That's Joe Dobbin. Uh, we're so grateful for you to stopping in at a short notice. Um, I know you've come off of an incredibly long shift. Um, you haven't had much time to prepare, and we completely respect that. Um, we're just currently discussing kind of what the situation is like with coronavirus, how it impacts people and what can be done in the future. But feel free to kind of just discuss whatever comes to mind and then we can just give you some questions to follow up on. OK, perfect. So uh, firstly, thanks so much for having me on talking. Um, and yeah, I have to apologise. I've not um, unfortunately missed the rest of the, the call and the chat and the other speakers um, because yeah, I just finished a shift and then was cycling home. Um, so I guess before I say anything, just definitely have to say I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a public health spe specialist, and I'm not an infectious disease specialist either. So these are just kind of my thoughts and uh, my experience of, of working um, as, a, as a junior doctor in London. Um, so yeah, my name is Joanna, I'm a junior doctor. I've been working um, in uh, one of the hospitals in central London, um, and I'm currently working on a coronavirus ward. Um, so I was, pull, I was pulled to work onto a coronavirus ward a couple of weeks ago, but I was working in the hospital before that, just on a, I, you know, on a geriatrics ward. Um, so I'll just, I don't know, talk a little bit about my experience um, of that and like how, so kind of how it's been, I think some of the staff involved in this. Um, first kind of became more worried about coronavirus um, at the beginning of March after I saw the statistics coming out of Italy. Um, uh, yeah, looked them up on a Sunday evening, which probably wasn't a good idea, but uh, so looking at, you know, five to 10% of patients requiring admission to intensive care. Um, I was like, oh my God, that, you know, that's, that's insane. That doesn't sound good. And then I 
did some reading and looked at the WHO fact-finding uh, mission that they did uh, in China, which they released in January, um, and the statistics from that kind of backed up what we were seeing in Italy. Um, and that's when I, you know, started to think like, oh my God, this is, you know, this is going to be a, a real problem. Um, and some specific things about, about the, the virus that, you know, were concerning initially, like thing, things like the fact that it's, um, you're, you're infectious for up to like 48 hours before you have symptoms um, and the onward transmission rate of two to three people. So like thinking, thinking, and then how, like the number of people that become unwell with it. So thinking about kind of some of those things, so I think this could be a real problem in the UK. Um, and then it was around this time when we started to see a couple of cases appearing in the hospital. Um, and at first it kind of really quickly grew exponentially. So at first it would be, you'd hear about the cases on the other ward, um, but they'd be on a specialist ward. Everyone dealing with them would be in the full prote protective gear. So that's kind of the equivalent of a hazmat suit. Um, what you can imagine that is. Um, like you see people fully gowned up um, and you know and there, and there was kind of like testing and contact tracing around that and then very quickly went from that you know being like well contained um, to okay no now you just have coronavirus patients on your ward and I think the kind of communication around this um, within my hospital and I think wider on a national level was a uh, was really poorly done there was a lot of kind of um, stress and like you know, panicking, but a lot of stress amongst staff. Um, there was a lot of confusion around PPE. I'm sure, I'm sorry, when I say PPE, personal protective gear. So basically stuff that you wear to try and minimize your chance of getting, uh, picking up the virus. Um, and, it, and it was very quickly stepped down. So it went within a, within a day from, you need a full suit to all you need is a gown, a gloves and a mask. And whilst, you know, Public Health England have, have said there is some, you know, there's some evidence behind that, uh, particularly the type of mask that you see. The kind of change overnight was um, quite, you know, quite concerning for staff members. Um, and there's been, you know, obviously there's been a real issue around getting uh, PPE. Uh, in my hospital, we're lucky enough that I generally on the ward um, with the confirmed patients have access to everything that I need apart from a visor, still seem to not get them, which I believe is actually linked to, I read an article saying the government uh, decided uh, it was too expensive to stockpile them a couple of years ago. So that's why we don't have any of them. Um, you know, but, uh, yeah, there's, you know, it's not, it's not so bad. For, whether it's for people in the community, people working in shops, on, on buses, like people working in GP surgeries and care workers for them, it's still um, a real issue on the ground um, in terms of getting access to PP. And the guidance keeps changing, uh, you know, keeps changing daily in terms of what, you know, what we need. Um, so all of that kind of created a rather worrying, like, toxic environment within the hospital, and there was a lot of stress and panic. Um, so, you know, since we had this kind of exponential growth, um, it's, I, I personally feel the whole thing's calmed down a bit, but I think it's important to emphasize as well as the personal protective equipment, like uh, in terms of the other stresses that, um, start you know staff are going through in terms of the mental stress i know um a number of um colleagues of mine who are having panic attacks people are going off sick from work um and in my trust we're quite lucky but like they've offered us a, um, a lot of support but i know that's not the case around the country um and i think you know some some of the some of the rhetoric around the uh, you know clap for the nhs and you know, there's a lot of kind of almost like putting us on a pedestal as healthcare workers. And in a way I understand it's like supposed to be appreciative um, for people and make us you know, feel supported. I think it can also put a lot of pressure on people to feel that they have to work. And I think particularly knowing, knowing what we do about the increased uh, mortality for people over a certain age, over 65 in particular, about you know, whether we should think about asking those people to kind of step back and to protect them. Um, but you know, I think there's a lot of pressure on people to you know do do their duty as it were for the NHS, and we have you know very really sad cases of doctors coming out of retirement, having you know worked for the NHS their whole lives, um, and then you know and then dying like work, like working on the front line, and whether that you know whether that was avoidable and whether whether the pressure the government put on that was um you know whether it was the right thing to do, um. 
so yeah, so <laughs> yeah, it's obviously been a bit of a bit of a roller coaster going through everything. Um, talking about a couple of I don't know a couple of other things. I think the government may or may not have done uh, correctly. I mean, again, when when there was this big explosion of cases um, in the hospital, like I, re I remember the kind of the change in tactics. So like one day um, and it was like, okay, we've had a patient on the ward, they tested positive. Um, and now, yeah, and, um, and now, um, yeah, it was like, what do we do if we've had like unprotected, like no personal protective equipment and we've had contact with them? Do we need to self-isolate, which had been the advice previously? And then the advice changed to no, you need to continue to work until you show symptoms. And this is around the same time Boris Johnson uh, was on TV saying, oh, you know, one, you know, one option is for us to, you know, take it on the chin. Um, and I just remember thinking like, this is, this is crazy because we know people are infectious um, before, you know, before they have symptoms. So it seems like we're really not actually trying to contain the virus anymore. Um, and in terms of testing and contract tracing in the community, that's something that, the that you know, we've really like not done here and which we see other countries um, like Germany and South Korea have uh, done much more aggressively. They plan for better. Germany got more tests, like started like compiling tests in earlier. Um, and, you know, they have like a much lower mortality rates than us. So, you know, whether that was a correct strategy and what we can do now, we're in this situation of, of playing, playing catch up with that. Um, yeah. Um, and what else can I say? <laughs> Sorry, I had like no time to prepare for this. Um, and then, other, yeah, other things to, you know, to think about. Um, I try, you know, try and be quite careful about what we say in terms of like, you don't want to, I don't, I don't want to stress or panic people by talking about like the situations um, in the hospitals when we talk about like rationing of um, of care because this is something that we actually do already um, a lot within you know in the NHS we don't put everybody that you know has organ failure into intensive care all the time we think about what the outcomes will be and whether that's reasonable and appropriate for them so these are things that you know already happen are already happening. But then obviously what we have is a situation here where a large number of patients, patients that um, develop uh, kind of particularly in the second week, um, what we call like R, it's acute respiratory distress syndrome. So it's kind of um, infiltrates throughout the lungs. So basically you can't get oxygen into your blood uh, stream properly. Whether, you know, so like and these people all need ventilation. So we have to start to think about who, like who it's appropriate to put on a ventilator. Um, and, I was talking with one of my colleagues earlier, uh, earlier today about this, about how we need to be uh, to ensure that we don't, throughout this pandemic, we don't allow kind of structural inequalities, health inequalities that already exist within society, how to make sure that these aren't exacerbated, um, which is obviously kind of hard to do. But I mean, you can think about kind of geographical Ge yeah, geographical inequalities. So my hospital in London, we're very lucky. We're actually very well staffed for doctors, less so for nurses. Obviously, the shortage of nurses nurses in the country is greater than doctors. But how to think about how, how we can, with the north-south -south divide, how we could redistribute doctors around the country, um, which is actually harder to do than you might think because of the internal market. So trust, hospital trusts actually kind of compete against each other. So they're not that happy to just... You know, if they're paying me to work in one hospital for me to just go off to another hospital where they're short staffed. Um, thinking about access to clinical trials, which again are much more um, kind of London centric. Uh, thinking about, um, yeah, and then, yeah, like, sorry, like I was originally saying, like access to like ventilators. So obviously we have to think about who, who does well in intensive care, who's more likely to, su to survive. Um, and, the, you know, the scales we use to look at and, which kind of make up make up how kind of how likely you are to do well so we look at things like um whether you're a smoker or an ex-smoker and we know people from uh um more disadvantaged backgrounds are more likely to be smokers that's one way that the um the, the pandemic can, can potentially like exacerbate health inequalities looking at comorbidities like hypertension and diabetes and again we know these are more prevalent in a uh, least socioeconomic uh, advantaged sectors of society um, so yeah, so trying, yeah, trying to think about what, you know, what we can do to make sure this is equitable. Um, also, obviously the lockdown, as, as I'm sure you've talked about and mentioned the way it's done, um, is it hits the, 
most vulnerable and disadvantaged people of society the worst in terms of um, job security, access to green spaces, etc. So, how we can, you know, how we can, like, think, you know, think about minimizing these. Um, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think I think that's kind of everything. Everything I have I thought of to say. So, any questions? Sorry if that was maybe a bit. Um, jumping around but yeah like I say just came off my shift and was given about you know an hour's notice to do this. Thank you so much that was uh perfect and definitely not rumbly like you think it was it was really really um helpful for people to hear about your experiences uh and yeah a really good way to end the call. Um we've had lots of questions but mostly people just saying huge amount of like solidarity and love and respect and thank you for everything you're doing um, and to all your colleagues. Uh, the one question I think would be helpful was if there was like one immediate thing you'd need the government to do to support you in your job, what would it be? And are there any more longer term demands we as a movement should be thinking about making? Um, so one, one, imme one immediate thing. <laughs> um, <I've, yeah. laughs> it doesn't have to be one, you can do oh, yeah. more. More nurses. I mean, unfortunately, you can't magic them out of the air. Um, I think. I think. Uh, hopefully, they should be looking at a way to move staff easily between NHS trusts. For um, and particular, particularly if we see like as as you know, we kind of peak on the curve in London. If it's going off elsewhere, if we can move staff around the country, um, and that maybe think feeds into longer term plans of thinking about like internal markets within the NHS and how we can get um get rid of them. They're obviously properly properly funding the NHS, the nurse shortage um, is a real issue. Um, and, and as I'm sure it's been said, like we unfortunately were, um, as great as the NHS are in after 10 years of austerity, we were not put on the best footing to start fighting this pandemic. Um, I think, you know, I th yeah, the government obviously moved too slowly that when was the first COBRA meeting, like 2nd of March or something, it's just, you know, um, having you know seen the stats, I can't believe the government all became worried about it at the same point that I did. I would have thought they would have had you know more advanced briefings. Um, I think yeah, I think I, I, I caught at the end of somebody else saying like migrant access to healthcare. I think that's really important. That's something um, I do a lot of uh, campaigning about, um, and um, particularly we see we've seen like a number of like migrant uh, doctors uh, unfortunately passing away working, and just to think about like. Um, how like people say oh it's not an international it's a national not international health service but it really is an international health service um i think yeah and, and and thinking about how by by thinking of the nhs as you know closed off to, to outside to influence from other countries actually we're, we're contributing to um global health inequalities and by you know we we have doctors and nurses uh, coming and we have actively recruit from um, the global south, from Nigeria and the Philippines, we leave these countries um, who have much worse health outcomes, shorter life expectancy than us. We leave them short of staff, and then if so, you know if somebody from one of these countries um, is here and doesn't have the correct paperwork, we deny them healthcare or you know charge them one hundred and fifty percent. So I think I think that's a I think it's a it's a real opportunity to think about the kind of world we want to live in and try and reframe some of them. Um, some of the arguments around this, which unfortunately just end up being a kind of us versus them, rather nasty rhetoric. Thank you so much for joining us and thanks for what you're doing right now. Um, so before we finish the call, we want to take a moment to remember that uh, coronavirus is not just affecting us here, but it's also affecting and changing the lives of millions of people across the world. And there are people everywhere raising similar demands and forcing governments and employers to put people for profit. Our struggle for a healthcare and welfare system which prioritises public health over private wealth here in the UK is wholly linked to that of our sisters and brothers abroad. Whilst tonight's call has had a stronger UK focus, Future calls will build out from the UK and we'll look at our internationalist response to the crisis too. So make sure you stay tuned for the calls that are happening over the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> and <clears throat> that basically brings us pretty much to the end of the call. We've just got a few more things before we wrap up. Uh, first, we want to remind everyone to look out for each other and yourselves. Uh, the prospect of being in our homes all the time can be really frightening for many. And we need to act as a community to show solidarity and to look after each other. TWT and Momentum are going to be trying to organize as many online spaces for people to interact as possible. Uh, TWT have already created a step-by-step -step guide for supporting people to run political education and organizing meetings online. And I think we'll post that link in the chat now.
Uh, please keep an eye out for reading groups and other kinds of political education, organizing meetings, and of course, tune into more calls like this same time each week. So that's Tuesday at 8 p.m. Finally, if you're able to, please, I implore you to join the TWT Supporters Network. Uh, political education on the left is important more, more now, more than ever, and the crisis poses a real risk to small organizations like TWT. Um, and you can do that by going to bit.ly forward slash TWT. That's bit.ly forward slash support TWT. Um, again, that link will be in the chat. Uh, next week, we'll be back again with some very special guest speakers from the UK and beyond the UK, believe it or not. So keep your eyes peeled for announcements in the coming days. Thank you so much to everyone for tuning in. And we'll see you next time, same time next week. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. And thanks to all the speakers for taking the time to uh, speak this evening. Thank you.